name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Monday, August 29th, 2016, and I'm in Grove, Oklahoma, interviewing Dr. Kathy Dunaway-Knight as part of our Cowboys in Every County Oral History Project. And Grove, Oklahoma is in Delaware County, so we're happy to be here. And Kathy, I would like to begin with learning a little bit more about you. Could you tell me the year you were born and where you were born? I was born in 1960, and I was born in Miami, Oklahoma. And I, my parents still live here in Delaware County, even though Miami is in Ottawa County. Um, I have two sisters, and they both live in Delaware County now as well. Um, one is a, uh, they both have social work background, and my uh, one sister is a uh, special ed director. So we have a very, very variety of careers. And I'm a veterinarian. I have um, a small animal clinic co-owned with Dr. Jan Smith here in Grove. Okay? We treat small animals, and we um, do all kinds of work there. I have three children, one stepson, Brian, who's married and lives in Indiana. I have a daughter, Amy, and she just graduated from pharmacy school at that other school in Oklahoma. And she just got married to Clay, and that he's in medical school at that Crimson University. And my son is in the Marine Corps, and he, Daniel, and he met a girl in the Marine Corps, and they got married last year. So we've had a lot of weddings. Wow, it's been busy. Yes, very busy. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you back and have you tell me a little bit about your parents. Okay. My mom's name is Ruth, Mary Ruth Osborne. She was from Commerce, Oklahoma. She worked as a lab technician, so that got me a little interested in medical stuff. And my dad, Winston, Vernon Winston Dunaway, is, um, he's been in Delaware County all of his life. I think they may have moved for a brief period during the Depression or something, but um, at least the end of the Depression because he was born during that time. Um, he is a has been a social worker and worked with the uh, DHS uh, back. He's been retired for quite a while now. But he has a, a love of all things uh, Cherokee, Native American. He knows a little bit of the language, so he, we are proud of our Cherokee heritage. So that was, uh, we grew up out in the sticks of Delaware County between Jay and Grove. We had a little farm, even though my parents both worked. Um, we had all kinds of animals, and that's what got me started in, in interest in veterinary medicine. Well, what type of animals did you have growing up? We had all types of animals. We tried a little bit of every kind of animal. I even had a cow that I had to milk before I went on dates. So I had to go home and milk my cow before I could could go on dates. We've had sheep, goats, dogs, cats, chickens, turkeys, guineas, horses, a beef cattle as well, all kinds, a menagerie of animals. Quail at one point, nothing real serious, just a lot of interesting animals to play with. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about your early, early school years growing up, your elementary school time. Well, I went to Jay Elementary School. We called it Jay Grade School at that time. I started there a long time ago. I, I think it's 65, 1965. I started there and went throughout my school years there. I had, have lifelong friends that uh, I met before I started school that I'm still friends with here in Delaware County. So we had those bonds. Uh, I enjoyed school, enjoyed uh, playing with other kids. I like school and most of it, um, but it was it was a, a fun time, as I recall, back in those early days and at J grade school. Was it a big school? Well, for the rural areas, it is a big school because they bus in a lot of children. So I'm not sure. In, in our class, like our age class, there might be a bit over 100 graduated. So for a town, J has a population of around 2,000. The school population is nearly what the town population is, is because of all the rural kids that get bused in. Mm -hmm. And did you also ride the bus to school? I did ride the bus to school a lot of the time. I recall 
I played bassoon. I played clarinet and bassoon, so I had to walk to the bus stop and I would sit on my bassoon while I waited for the bus to arrive. And, and that, later on, the, my dad dropped us off sometimes, but yeah, we were, we were school bus riders. Mm -hmm. And that was a good time. A little hot in the summer and dusty at times, but it was a, it was a, a good time. We had a good time. Had lots of friends on the bus. So we, we enjoyed that time. Where'd you go after Jay? After Jay, I went to NEO, A&M College in Miami. I went there for two years. I uh, roomed with my best friend, Anita. We um, had gone to high school together, and then we were roommates in the old-fashioned, I think they still have those dorms where there are, you know, a tiny room and two beds, and you kind of share all your stuff. And so Anita and I roomed there for two years, and we, uh, we were Norsemen, and, and I uh, was in the animal science uh, class or animal science classes. And at one point, did you did you know even then that you wanted to go on and become a veterinarian? I think um, I wanted to be a veterinarian as long as I can remember. So when I was a kid, um, we had a fair number of animal problems as people that have animals, mostly livestock issues. We had dogs and cats, but you know, cattle that were sick or difficult births, dystocious. So we would go to the veterinarian and I I think probably from any time from early elementary school I wanted to be a veterinarian. I don't know, there, there wasn't a specific day I decided. It was just always seemed like that's what it was going to be. Would you help doctor the animals on the farm? Oh sure, yeah. Yeah I would. That was my job. I took care of the animals. My sister did too but I didn't like to clean the house or cook or anything like that, so I was always trying to get out, out of the house to take care of the animals. So I would get old veterinary books and or livestock care books and read about, try to figure out what was wrong, and yeah, lots of doctoring animals in my time, and orphan animals, bottle feeding animals, that kind of thing. Well, you're at NEO, and you're living in the dorm. How did you get to NEO? Did you have a car? Did not have a car. Okay. Um, my friend Anita and I would, our parents would swap off dropping us off. Okay. Or we'd get a ride with a friend, but mostly it was one of our parents who picked us up. And then I think Anita got a car at some point. I think when she got a car, I hitched a ride with her. Any memories from your, from your time at NEO that stand out for you? Well, I think it was very different than being at Jay, even though NEO is a small college, it was the uh, influx of different um, cultures and in Jay we we are mostly Native American people. I, I don't know the percentage of the number of, of actual card-carrying Native Americans compared to just the non-natives, but uh, so I went from Mostly, and we call them Indians, and they still call themselves Indians. Uh, mostly Indians and whites, to a you know multi-ethnic area in the dorms, and so that was very interesting for us to to have that just immersion in in different cultures. And so that was that was fun. It was a little different, but we were we we soon developed all all different types of friends, and and that was fun. And it, and at that time, I met some other pre-vet students and got to, got to know other folks who thought they wanted to be veterinarians. Back in, the, in that time, 1978, when I went to NEO, there were very few women veterinarians. I had never met a woman veterinarian until I actually got to Stillwater and started vet school. So it was, it was lots of guys pre-vet, you know, some women or girls, at that time, but uh, so it was, it was, I studied a lot, or more than my friends. Mm -hmm. Well, any, any classes that really stand out for you at NEO? Well, it's been a little while since I was there, <laughs> but chemistry, I like chemistry and I like biochem. I worked in the, uh, well, not biochem, but microbiology. I worked as a uh, kind of a work-study student in the microbiology lab. It was a small lab, so I uh, really liked that opportunity to work in the micro lab. So I guess probably that was, was the 
class that I recall. And at that point, was NEO a two-year college? Yes. Okay. Still is. Okay. And so you, you finish up at NEO in which year? 1980. 1980. And so what happens after 1980? Well, NEO is closely associated with OSU in their uh, pre-vet agriculture stuff. So uh, one thing that was cool about NEO, or not so cool, is that I um, worked for a veterinarian on the weekends. And it was a, a what we call mixed practice. So small animals, dogs, cats, large animals, cattle, horses, whatever those, whatever animal came in. So I worked at the sale barn, and the sale barn is where you bring your animals to sale, obviously, cattle and pigs, and I had got to experience uh, put tags on pigs and taking blood from cattle and those kind of things, but I contracted uh, a cattle disease called brucellosis. And brucellosis is a zoonotic disease, which means people get it and animals get it. It can be transmitted by drinking milk or it can be transmitted by the vaccine at that time, getting exposed to that, or from blood, blood contamination. So I contracted that when I was in my second year at NEO, and I was pretty sick. So the, that was in December, and I was in the hospital for three weeks. And I, my most concern was that I hadn't had my finals yet. So I worked, I worked that out and went back and was able to finish my classes because I didn't want to get behind and go into veterinary school. But the problem is it was treated with streptomycin, which is an antibiotic that can cause some toxicity. So I lost my vestibular nerve function, which helps control balance. That's part of your balance control. So I wasn't able to stand up without a walker. So part of the time at NEO, about three months, after I contracted that of my last semester, I had to use a walker and I was upstairs in the dorm. And so I had great friends who helped me navigate the stairs and throw my walker in the back of their truck and drive me to my classes. And, and so I, I recall fondly the end of my time at NEO before I went to OSU that I was still very determined to become a veterinarian. And now looking back, I'm thinking, I should have taken a year off, but that didn't even seem like an option. Very motivated mm -hmm. um, to continue. So, th so that, that time um, was, was very cool as far as work, you know, friends helping me, um, you know, get my stuff done, get me up and down the stairs and those kind of things. And I was awarded in 1980 the best agriculture student. So that was a, a big deal when I... I, it wasn't a big, big deal, but it was kind of cool that I think they recognized that I had struggled during that time, and so that was a, and, and I had a friend who was, I think she was going to be a physical therapist. I don't know that that really happened, but anyway, she was the one that helped me down the, the outside, the, the um, it was, it was at like the football field, mm -hmm. and there was like no handrail type thing, so she kind of helped me get down there so I could go up and get my, my award. So because... NEO is closely associated with OSU, the prerequisites, it was kind of fairly seamless to move on to OSU mm -hmm. in 1980 and finish my prerequisites to apply to veterinary school. Did you, did you spend much time or visit Stillwater when you were growing up? No, we didn't travel much, so I, I just knew that that's where the vet school is, mm -hmm. and I knew a few people who had gone to Stillwater and I thought it was a great campus but and then what I found that out once I arrived but it's just if you want to get from point A to point B in Oklahoma there's you, I could have gone directly to Stillwater mm -hmm. but being from Jay I decided to go to, to NEO first mm -hmm. and then uh, once I got to Stillwater it was a bit overwhelming but it's a beautiful campus and uh, stayed in an apartment with a, uh, Anita and I also went to to uh, OSU initially, and she was my first roommate there, and we got an apartment. And I started to finish my prerequisites, and I love Stillwater. So, tell me about moving day, getting from NEO to Stillwater. Did you have a car at this point? I did have a car at that point, but I I had a friend who was a veterinarian that worked here in Grove, mm -hmm. a guy, and he um, obviously was very familiar with Stillwater, so 
at one point he even helped me move some of my stuff to just kind of help get oriented but it was it was a pretty exciting time to go from J to NEO to Stillwater I love Stillwater where'd you live in town well we lived in apartments that no longer exist close to the football stadium uh, north of there um, some little apartments that I right now I can't recall the name of mm -hmm. patio club patio club apartments so we lived in a little one bedroom apartment with a little kind of kitchenette thing and and we lived there for a year and then as most veterinary students as a lot of veterinary students uh, lived in mobile homes we call them trailers of course so there were a couple trailer parks and that's where a lot of the vet students live so after I did my third year of college or first year at Stillwater, uh, my parents decided that it would be wise and we bought a trailer mobile home from another graduating veterinary couple and that's where I lived the rest of the time out on, um, on se off, just off of uh, 7th Street on the um, east side of town. Hmm. So you're, you're at Stillwater and you're finishing up your undergraduate degree. Correct. In in agriculture, fortunately, if you think that you want to be a veterinarian, there are two different paths. You can go through the College of Agriculture undergrad, or you can go to the College of Arts and Sciences. And so I had chosen the agriculture animal science path because if you do certain classes, you can, after three years, and then you get accepted to vet school, after a year of vet school, you can get your bachelor's degree awarded mm -hmm. in agriculture. So that's the path I took. Okay. And looking back as you were finishing up your undergraduate uh, years there at OSU, professors, classes that come to mind? Biochemistry comes to mind because it was at 7.30 in the morning <laughs> and it was really hard. And honestly, I don't remember my professor because we're talking, uh, you know. <laughs> A long time ago, uh, all I remember is it was really hard, and I thought, I'm not sure that, that this may not be this. Am I going to be able to do this? Because I going from J to NEO was difficult, and the, initially the classes were hard, and I thought this is college, and this is way different because I never really studied before. Mm -hmm. And so I thought thought I knew how to study. Then after I'd been at NEO, and then I went to OSU, and I was in genetics and biochemistry, and I was like, wow, can I even do this and it was a big class and EO had small classes and so when I went to OSU and there were 300 people in the class and it was at 7 30 in the morning it was yeah it was challenging but it was it made it through there mm -hmm. did you work while you were going to school I, I worked that first year at the diagnostic lab the Oklahoma animal disease diagnostic lab there and I worked I think 12 hours a week or something when I was my third year. I did not work when I was in veterinary school. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. And so when I got accepted at vet school, we were waiting for our mail and all of us that had applied, because that's some friends that came from NEO that applied. And you know, it was all actual snail mail back then. So I, they, they said if it's a if it's a thin envelope, that's good, or it could be bad. If it's a thick envelope, that that's good because it has papers in it, you know, you have to fill out. So we all anxiously awaited. And I ran and got my mail and I had a thick envelope and I opened it and I was like, uh, you know, congratulations, you've been accepted. And I was so excited. And I was 20, I was, I was super excited. And not that I wouldn't be excited at any age about that. And then I went to school, went to work at the diagnostic lab and Dr. Goodman, in the toxicology lab was who I was working with. And I went in and I said, really nice guy, but kind of, I said, I, I have some great news. I got accepted into vet school. And he's like, what's the great news? <laughs> so I was like, it's so exciting. He said, yeah, it's exciting. You'll see. So, so just that, that elation and then being concerned about you know, communicating with anybody else that you knew that had had applied because you didn't really want to ask them. And so I had another friend from Grove 
um, that I went to undergrad grad with uh, Stan Johnson, and he also got accepted, and we started the same class at school. Was it tough? Was it at that point to, to, to get gain accepted? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, it was tough. It, over the years, I think it varies, but it, it, it can be uh, more difficult to get into veterinary school than medical school. Mm -hmm. And I think that that may still be the case because there's a lot more uh, medical schools many more medical schools than there are veterinary schools. Mm -hmm. So was it, yeah, it was tough. It was, it was exciting. But it, yeah, it was tough. And it, it was an interview process with a committee and, and then lots of questions and different situations. But I, I don't recall much about that interview. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I got accepted. So I was pretty excited. So you started vet school in what year? 1980. All right, 1980. First year of vet school. Yes. What's going through your mind as you're sitting in these classes? First week of vet school, I wrote a letter to my friend Anita and said, there is no way I can learn this stuff. There's too much. The volume was, the volume of material and the speed at which we were supposed to retain it was overwhelming. And that was a common thought for most people, but yeah, the very first week when Dr. Peterson got up and showed the anatomy and all started naming all the, all the <laughs> different muscles and all the bones and every little notch on a bone has a name and I thought, I, I don't know how these other people got to be vets, but I can't do it. So I wrote a letter to her and said, I, yeah, I can't, you know, like the actual old fashioned letters. So the, but, but all of us were in that situation I mean, none of us thought, oh, this is easy. Well, if they did, they didn't talk to us, to some of us. So that, yeah, it was, it was uh, mind-blowing, the beginning of veterinary school. I think they make it that way. Mm -hmm. Just to try to see if you're serious about it, and then just to give you an idea. And it goes on that way. It goes on that way for the entire four years. Although it changes a little bit. But, yeah, that beginning I remember very well. And how were you able to... Find that balance between the the rigor mm -hmm. and your sanity. Well, it it was difficult in the beginning because of just there was no free time. But then we were in groups, so you got to be friends with your groups, and it turned out that I think it was the second week of vet school, second or third week of vet school. I totaled my car on the way to school. I didn't get hurt, no one got hurt, but it was, it was, it was an older car, and it, yeah, sort of rear-ended someone, and kind of navigating my way to campus and getting used to that, and so I totaled my car, so my second year of week, second week of that school, and I had noticed that in my trailer park, mobile home park, that I saw one of my classmates, because we had the same schedule. We all were on the same schedule, and I had seen her drive in and out. So I befriended her, and she lived just like two trailers over. And so fortunately, uh, I was able to hitch a ride with her until I could get something else to drive, and we became good friends. Mary Gray, she, she and I were friends uh, throughout vet school, and, and still are, and she, she was much more studious than I was. Most of my friends were. And so Delena, it, in the beginning, we were alphabetical in our groups. And so it's kind of strange that the people that were in my group initially in anatomy, I'm, I'm still friends with those, closer to those people, because you just bond over the, the amount of time and work. And then, um, so I, the friendships, I think, were really important mm -hmm. in communicating. We all had that same same stuff going on. A few classmates were married. Mary was married and had a small child. So later, after I had children, I realized how difficult that must have been. But for uh, most of us, or a lot of us that we hung out together, we studied and then we kind of talked and studied and talked. And some studied more. But. Well, favorite classes? In veterinary school. Mm -hmm. Favorite class. Did you have a favorite class? About the classes you remember the most? I, I liked it when it got to be more clinical. 
Mm -hmm. And so small animal medicine classes or those types of disease classes about, about infectious disease, I like to learn about that. Mm -hmm. But anatomy, not so much. I, could, I thought I could always just look it up if I really needed to know. So that was a tough class. That's like in the first year. But worked out. Professors that you recall? Dr. Peterson and Dr. Friend, both, both of which have passed away, were the anatomy teachers. And they were as excellent teachers and wonderful men, wonderful veterinarians. And they seemed really old then, but I'm not sure. I, I think they weren't young, but they weren't as old as they seemed because, you know, they're probably my age now. Uh, but they were so enthusiastic about anatomy and about teaching the students. It was, it was, I was, and because I didn't like anatomy, because I found it boring, it was nice to see that they were still that enthusiastic. And it's important. I mean, anatomy is very important as you progress on. How do you learn physiology if you don't understand anatomy? But the fact that they were still so enthused about teaching um, at that point, and, it, and that was one of the very first classes. So they, they were great guys and very uh, enthusiastic. And then, and then uh, Dr. Mary Bowles, she, she taught some um, medicine classes like um, urology and different specialties, but she was a clinician in the small animal clinic. And she was the first female veterinarian that I ever encountered. And at that time, I think we had 20-some people and women in our veterinary class out of 70. They didn't all make it, but out of 70 that started. And now the vast majority are women hmm. in veterinary classes. So, so Dr. Bowles and then Dr. Peterson and Dr. Friend, and there were, there were other people, but those are the ones that come to mind right off. Well, the, the facility, the building, has changed quite a bit through the years. What do you recall from the vet school when you were attending? One of the things that we all recall is um, in anatomy, there was a thing called the rack. And it was a wooden structure that the students would be like standing up and leaning on these wooden rack. And there were like three, three levels of that. So they would you would climb up. I was always on the bottom because I didn't have any balance, so there was no, I wasn't climbing. So we, you would stand, and there's a picture of it over there in the hallway. So we would stand and lean over, and then that way we could see whatever was happening that, that they were demonstrating. Um, and we were standing up, and we did a lot of sitting in, in, in the initial years, so it was, it, was, it was nice. But all of us um, recall the rack. They don't do that anymore, of course, but... But that, so that part of the building, I visited there last year, my 30th reunion. We had several of our classmates that got together, and so we were reminiscing about the rack and toured, toured the new campus. But the veterinary small animal clinic or the veterinary hospital was brand new. We were one of the first classes to, u to utilize that, and that has changed some, but a lot of that is still very similar to what it was when we were there um, with that, with some initial, some additional upgrading and as technology has improved, but but the the rack and then just um, the anatomy lab because of the formalin and all that has a certain odor of formalin and and so that's pretty memorable, which is probably not something most people answer to this question. That smell of formalin <laughs> and being in the rack <laughs> was. <laughs> uh, you were you were exposed to probably many different types of animals. Were you gravitating when you were thinking about your career to more small animal or large animal? Well, initially, when I was a child and in high school and as working, I worked for the veterinarian, as I said earlier, here in Grove. Um, I was always thought that I was gonna do mixed practice. So cattle, sheep, goats, small animals, I really like cats. So I, I thought that it would be all those and I would, that was the plan. Uh, after I got into veterinary school, uh, 
after I had that issue with my my balance and that made it more difficult to do some of that stuff and and some of that that's improved a lot but it's still not it's not normal so not normal it, but but my balance is still messed up and and so the the and I'm short not that you can't be short and be a horse veterinarian but it makes it a little bit more difficult so during vet school, I started to decide that probably small animal medicine was was more suited to what I wanted to do. And maybe I didn't want to be going out in the blizzard to pull a calf in the middle of a pasture. Mm -hmm. So I decided small animal, but I had, didn't start out originally wanting to do small animal. How many were in your, your class when you started in 1980? I think there were 70, somewhere around 70, maybe 68. And by the time graduation rolled around? Well, we lost at least five. And, and in veterinary school at that time, I'm not sure what happens now. Um, if someone, if you, if you flunked one class, um, you were out. So if you flunked, and we were all on the same class schedules. If you flunked a class, you were, you were out for that semester, and then you had to petition to be to restart and you had to take take the whole year over. And so we had a couple of people that were from previous classes that joined our class. So the number, I don't recall the exact number, but we lost quite a few in virology. Virology, there was a new instructor and it was tough. And, and we, we, virology did some of them in and some of those decided to come back and, and some of them decided to pursue other careers. Was there a point during your time in vet school where you were like, I got this, I'm home free, I could see the, I could see the fish, finish line? Mm, no. No. I always liked the clinical part much better than the class part. Mm -hmm. And I had, since I had worked in veterinary clinics, I had more of a knowledge of clinical practice than some of my classmates that hadn't had that opportunity. So it was always more geared to, well, when we get to clinics, I'm going to be in better shape and I'm going to like it more, which most, most of us did, as opposed to sitting in class. Because veterinarians are not really just people who like to sit in class. Mm -hmm. They like to do stuff. And so... I think, I, I don't recall being home free because once you get finished, you have to pass your boards. So there's that, there's always that, you know, do I know enough? How much more, what am I, you know, lacking in? And are they really going to ask that many chicken questions on the boards? And, and so I, it got better um, as far as that goes, but no, you never, because it's very intense the whole way through. Do you take boards before you graduate? No. Okay. I don't know what they do now. Mm -hmm. uh, but we grad well, it was almost at the same time. Mm -hmm. It was like the week before graduation, or it was, I think it was, yeah, like the week before graduation we took boards. We took, uh, there's a national board, and then there's a, an Oklahoma board, mm -hmm. and we took both. So that was, it's always stressful. Well, tell me about graduation. Well, graduation was good because, well, we were finished, but I met my husband at the OSU um, teaching hospital. He was an electrician. So Ron was an electrician there, and we kind of saw him around, and we'd say hi to him. And so during, our, during my uh, last year, fourth year, um, we got to be friends and, and quickly fell in love, and got engaged in February and then I graduated in May and we had our we set our our wedding date for October so we were so it was it, it was graduation and being engaged and so it was it was a pretty exciting time and grad, my, my, and my family all came for graduation and my even my grandpa he wasn't in very good health but he came down and graduation was an exciting time and some of my cousins came and it was just fun, and they were teasing me. I thought you'd be in the top ten. Yeah, no, no, not me. <laughs> but it was a it was a great day and a lot of fun. Now, what year did you graduate? Nineteen eighty five. Okay. So nineteen eighty five, graduated, taking your boards, waiting to find out if I passed. What What were you planning to do after graduation? Well, in nineteen eighty five in Oklahoma. Uh, 
there were not many veterinary jobs. Um, and when you limit yourself to small animal, that knocks out some of the mixed practices. So I interviewed in many places, many jobs in Oklahoma I interviewed for, but I also, uh, even though my parents didn't like to travel, we didn't grow up traveling, I like to travel. So Ron and I decided, well, let's just move somewhere. So I interviewed at, uh, with, with veterinarians from Alaska, North Carolina. I didn't travel to all those places, but uh, I went to Colorado and interviewed um, and lots of, lots of places. So when I graduated, because the job market was such that it was, I did not have a job lined up. And it was a, that was a very difficult time because... I'm 24, I've had this goal. Even though I was engaged, I had this goal of being a veterinarian. And so everything is sort of goal-oriented, oriented to being a veterinarian. So then, 24 years old, I'm a veterinarian. I couldn't get a job. So it was like, well, this isn't really what I had in mind. And so it was it was a difficult time, and I think that's true for uh, other other veterinarians or other graduates, um, but particularly that was a, even though it was a big elation for the graduation, then afterwards it was a it was a very uh, I don't know it was an unusual time, no not knowing what was going to happen besides the wedding part, but still I needed a job and and so that was a, a tough time. So I had decided as recommended to go to uh, if you were going to practice in any state. You should take your state board in that state as soon as you do after you graduate because if you don't practice in all aspects, then you'll forget stuff. So I decided I was going to take the California boards. So I signed up to do that, sort of on a whim. And my husband, well, my fiance Ron, my mom, and my sister Janet decided we were going to take a road trip to California and just one of the stops was for me to take my boards. So we drove, went to the Grand Canyon, went to California. My uncle and aunt and cousins lived in California, so that's why mom mom wanted to go. So we just went down south to, to uh, the area where I was taking my boards. It was south of LA, Irvine, I think. And it was just one spot on this trip. You know, here's the Grand Canyon, here's, oh, this is the date of the boards, I need to be there. I didn't study. I had one job interview in that area at a clinic, and then we were going to travel to visit my uncle and his family in uh, Lompoc, which is the central coast north of Santa Barbara. And that was just going to be, it was going to be a fun trip. I mean, I'm still looking for a job, but I thought, why not? When will I have time to, to do this? So we, we had a great trip. We traveled. I went in. I took, I saw some of my classmates, two of my classmates that were going to practice in California had already started working uh, were there and they were like well did you study and I said well not 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 really um, so one of my classmates said well my boss gave me a week off so I could study all the California stuff before and I was like well, th well that's good uh, do you realize and I said you, you know what I, I'm here I'm just gonna take the test I don't have a job here I'm just not gonna sweat it so there were 300 people, it was all multiple choice, and they didn't have their act together in the beginning of the testing, and of course it was all on paper. So I'm watching the clock, and I've left my mom and Ron and Janet at the hotel, and there was a checkout time, and I had the vehicle. And so I was like, well, when are they going to get this thing going? It's supposed to start at 8. It was like past 9 before they got it started. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to hurry up because I think checkout's at 11. So I went through there and did my test. And the way I do tests, and now it's a little more difficult with the electronic. My daughter just did her pharmacy boards. But I would go through and choose all the ones I knew the answer to to get some confidence. And then I would go back and work on the ones. So I just went through and marked. And I looked around, and no one else had finished their tests. But I looked and thought, i got to get back to pick them up. So I stood up. And walked down to the front, and I was the first one finished, and I got all these people <laughs> giving me this look. And I said, gave it to them, walked out, had an interview the next day in Temecula, 
and the guy offered me a job if I passed the test. And, and it turned out we didn't really want to live there in Temecula, so... And then we went to visit my uncle, and during that time he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm, you know, I'm looking for a job, and he said, you should call my, my vet in Santa Maria. He always seems busy, and it seems like he needs another vet. So I just called him. He was busy. He answered the phone, Dr. Jack Sorbeck. He was 55. He had had a partner. She had moved on to, a, to go to UC Davis, and he was really tired. And I, Ron and I went over, talked to him, gave him my resume, and he had graduated from Colorado State, and he said he didn't like all the attitudes of the kids that graduated from Davis, which is where the vet school is in California, and he offered me a job that day if I passed my boards. And he said, did you pass your board? Do you think you passed? I said, I don't know. And then I'm thinking I should have tried harder, probably. And then the, the veterinarian the previous day had said, did you know that half of the Davis grads don't pass their California boards? And I said, no, I didn't know that. So then, I, then we finished our vacation. We went home, and Dr. Sorbeck kept kind of calling, hey, have you passed your, I, I haven't heard, I haven't heard. and. Um, so I passed and then I moved to California and Ron was still working at the vet school until um, and we got married in October back here in Oklahoma at my parents' house. So, so I moved out there and started working, um, stayed with my aunt and uncle, then rented a house and started working in, in California. And how long were you in California? We were in California about eight years and practice small animal medicine there, and on the weekends we would go travel and, and see places I had never been, because I just hadn't really. I'd been to California once before during my last year of vet school. We had this time called externships, and we could make arrangements with different veterinarians, and so three of us had gone to California in different practices, and, and I stayed in Hermosa Beach and worked at a, a cancer one of the first veterinary oncology clinics, Coast Pet Clinic, was part of what they did. And I stayed upstairs, and so I was like, I kind of like this, California. <laughs> so then I, then after Ron and I, I came back and Ron and I got married at my parents' house, and that was great, great fun, and um, rode up in a buggy, and it was just out in the sticks in Oklahoma, and my dad built a gazebo, and so that was in 1985 as well, October. And then we got in his truck with a trailer and drove to California and lived there. What a great story about passing the boards. I mean, it was just a... It was a God thing. You know, it was a God thing because I, a part of the issue, and one of my classmates that took the boards there did not pass. And a lot of people did not pass. But it was the way they structured their questions at that time is that, more than one could sort of be right. And I just went through and picked my first, you know, what I thought was the best answer. And because of literally the time issue, I didn't spend a, I didn't feel a lot of stress because I didn't have a job there. And I just thought if I pass, I pass. And so that was, and, and there have been a lot of people that have flunked them since then too. So I try not to say hmm. I was the first one finished and I got like 85%, but that's not, that's not important. <laughs> well, how did you get back to Oklahoma? Well, I worked for Dr. Sorbeck. He was my mentor uh, during those early years of practice. And at one day, he came in and said, I'm sick of this. I'm going to sell the practice. And we had just built a new practice. Um, there was a developer that wanted the property where the other practice was, and in exchange, he offered to let Dr. Sorbeck design a practice, a building, and he would build it, and then they would exchange. So I had helped him design this new practice. I mean, every bit of the, of the planning. And so I was very vested in this building and in the staff, because I did a lot of the staff management at that time too. And I had a lot of clients, and I really, I really loved it. Um, but by that time, we had Amy, and she was three years old, and she was in daycare. 
all of our family was back here in Oklahoma and he's from Coffeeville or Coffeeville. So Amy didn't see her grandparents very often. I didn't see my parents very often. My sister had children and so they, they didn't really know each other very well. So he came in one day and said, um, do you wanna, I'm gonna sell the practice. Okay, um, and do you wanna buy it? And I said, well, um, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. Um, that was about seven years in. So I went home and talked to Ron and we had a lot of discussion about it. Did we want to commit to, you know, getting the money to buy this practice and being attached to it and then being for sure away from Oklahoma and and what what would that lifestyle look like for Amy and any other children that we had? I did not like uh, her being in daycare all the time. I didn't like that at all. I liked the practice. I didn't like being on call. I didn't like um, just the time. The time it was a very difficult time. M many working mothers have the same situations, but. We decided that we did not want to commit the money uh, to, to buy that practice, but mostly commit that we would stay in California. So we decided we were going to move back to Oklahoma and I was going to stay home with Amy and maybe we have another child, which, which we did, and give all that up, give up my clientele that I had established. And since I was only an associate, I had no ownership in that practice, so I didn't, when I left, I, I mean, I had all these very dedicated clients because he was tired when I started, and so over that time, he, he had let me develop quite a clientele, but of course, it was, it was of no value to me financially. I mean, it was, it was a great experience, I had a great time, lots of wonderful people, and, and, and that time was, was rich, and, in seeing a new part of the country, and, and so it was, it was, it was a good time, but it was not a, not a place we needed to stay. Um, our values are different than some of the folks there, and it was more liberal than what I wanted to raise my daughter in. Even though she had excellent childcare while she was there, she was still little. And so we moved back home so that she would be back here in Oklahoma, and when she grew up, she would not be, um, Californian per se, she would be, even though she still says she's a California native. Uh, so we and we, uh, family's important. So we moved back home so we could we could spend, so I could spend time with her more at, in those years, and also so she could get to know her grandparents and her cousins. And so she grew up with her grandparents and Ron's parents. Ron's mom's passed away now, but you know got to see them frequently and. And so it was, it was a better environment. I never have regretted leaving California occasionally, the weather, snowstorm or something. I didn't dislike it. I saw friends there, but it was not where I wanted to raise, where we chose to raise our family. And eventually you started practicing again? I did. I, I started practicing as soon as I got back because my mother worked at the hospital in the lab. She was a lab technician. And Dr. McGregor, who had the practice where I am now, um, was pregnant. And she was a solo practitioner, so she was the only veterinarian. And she did not have anyone to work when she had her baby. So she had said to mom, so your daughter's a veterinarian. I think mom had said my daughter's a veterinarian because she would take blood over there for them to you know, do lab work on. And so she said, as soon as she gets back, I need to talk to her. And mom's like, I don't know if she wants to work. She's kind of, you know. so as soon as I got back, I called her because she was nearly ready to deliver and she needed someone to work. So I helped her out when I came back. And so did Dr. Smith, Jen Smith, who's my cohort, co-owner out there. She helped her out some as well. We did, Jan and I didn't see each other because she would work a day and she was in Tulsa and I would work another day to keep the practice. And so it did that. And then I said, yeah, I'm not gonna practice for a while. So I worked just a little bit and filled in and helped her out and got to spend a lot of time with um, Amy and getting involved in some other activities. <laughs> um, but I was always very, um, oriented to to my children's age in that I'm not a kid person. Lots of people are kid people. 
I'm an animal person. But when, when, when there were my children, that was a different story. So when I was in California, um, I was concerned about um, licensed daycare providers not having to have any first aid or CPR training. It wasn't a requirement. No, I mean, California has lots of requirements. And I was like, this doesn't, they don't have to have first aid to be a licensed. So I worked with a um, assemblyman and we proposed legislation and did safety fairs about educating people about uh, that, that topic and went to uh, Sacramento and, and, uh, helped with this legislation and so we got a, a, a law passed that the daycare providers have to have first aid or NCPR training. So I was very focused on that. So when I came back to Oklahoma and I um, was home with Amy, I was, it was great and I like to be home with her but I don't really cook that much. Cleaning's not my thing, I'm used to being working. So when she started going to, looking at going to school, I saw at Jay, and I, and I love Jay, and it's my hometown, and I love the people of Jay. Great community, very community-oriented. Um, they didn't have a decent playground. They had some equipment on asphalt. And I thought, this is not okay. So I decided that we should work on that. So I helped start a PTA. They had had a PTA in the past, but started a PTA and then worked fundraising for a year and raised $85,000 in the very low income area of Delaware County, Oklahoma. South Delaware County, Oklahoma is different than North Delaware County, Oklahoma. And so we worked together to, um, with a many, many helpers, many other people worked on this. Um, so that was kind of a full-time job for me, and we built a uh, community bit playground. The, the playground folks came and interviewed the children. The children gave their ideas of what they wanted. The community gave their ideas, and it was this year-long process of raising the money, and then it was done in a barn-raising build. And, and in Jay, Oklahoma, because of the socioeconomic situation, um, as in other parts of the world, uh, people in poverty have a sense of hopelessness and a sense that I can't do better and I can't, um, I can't get out of this. And so for them, over a thousand different people worked during that five-day build of that playground. And you, so you would see a judge and then someone who was probably illiterate working together in different little teams to build this playground. And so people still, that was in 1997. And people still say that we're involved in that. That was the best thing that ever happened at Jay. Now it was wood, it was treated lumber, it was amazing, it was awesome, but time and, and many hours of use. So I think last year they had to tear it down or whatever just be, because of, of, of situations with it. But during that time, many children spent many, many hours on that. Playground. So I kind of decided that I probably needed to work more where I got paid because I, that stay-at-home thing was, was, was not really my cup of tea because uh, I didn't really stay at home. I, did, well, I took Amy, and by that time we had Daniel. And so I had a toddler and Amy, and she was in school. And so when she was in kindergarten, we started the very first beginning of that. And by I, I don't remember what grade she was in, but in 1997... Yeah, the news people were here from Tulsa. But mostly, it wasn't what I did. It was, it was just that I had that vision and tenacity, which is why I became a better, how, how I became a veterinarian. But vision and tenacity to, to see that. And then, because so many people said, well, that's not, you're, you're not going to be able to do that. It's just not going to happen. People in Jay won't, they won't do it. And, and that, I found that very frustrating. But once they saw it was the best thing, not the best thing probably ever, but for the Jay community, it was, it was awesome. And it was awesome for those children whose parents didn't seem like they could do anything to be able to 
come and help with that, you know, that playground hmm. to see their parents valued. So it was good. It was in 1997, and so I don't remember the question, but that's... Well, how did you... Uh, tell me about going back to full-time work. So I started working like um, one weekend a month to pay for my insurance, which was way cheaper then, and then it got to be two weekends a month, and then it got to be Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then it got to be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then it just... It was a gradual increase. Dr. McGregor, her business got busier and she needed uh, someone to to work. And, it, and so Dr. Smith also came and we finally met each other and then we, we started working for her. And so it was back to full-time veterinary practice and the kids were bigger and uh, Daniel was born um, in 1993. So... He was he was around so for but for the very first um, year when I was pregnant in the first year of his life I did not work very much but enough to keep to keep in the hang of it and so it was it was sort of a gradual more work and finally I'm back to working to full time and I'm like yeah I'm working full time now and so now uh, you and your partner own the practice we do. Yeah, we bought it. The, a similar situation happened. Dr. McGregor came in one day and said, I'm going to move back to Kentucky. I'm going to sell the practice. Do you guys want to buy it? And we were like, oh, wow. We were fine. We were fine the way it was. So we did not want to work for another employee. We didn't want someone else to buy it because we've been there a long time. We didn't want to go find new jobs. We didn't want to move. Didn't want to travel. I entertained some other possibilities as far as, I mean, like as a drug rep, as a technical service veterinarian, that kind of travel. Thought about teaching, but we both decided we would just stay there and buy a job. So we did. What year did you take over? I think it was 2000, 2001. We we made a situation where we each, uh, she retained a third of it and we each bought a third. And then after a year, we had the option to buy the rest of the practice. And so we, we did that. We bought the rest of it. So it's 2001, I think, was when we, we, we bought it. How busy are you guys? <laughs> well, it depends. Some days we're really busy and right now they're probably wondering where I am. But <laughs> it varies. Uh, spring is very busy. Winter sometimes is busy. It's 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 really crazy busy sometimes, and other times it's not so bad. But it's great. Well, you you kind of touched upon this a little bit. How has how has Delaware County changed through the years? Well, I think when you talk about Delaware County, you have to um, realize that. The southern part of Delaware County and the northern part of Delaware County are really very different worlds. And Grove, which is where we have our clinic, and um, with the Grand Lake area, has a lot of retirement people, a lot of influx of people moving in from other areas. So that brings a whole different dynamic to practice um, than was a long time. People have always come to Grand Lake, but it's it's and have lived around Grand Lake, but now it's it's more um, more diversity in the folks and where they're from when they move here. So so at, at the clinic, when we get new clients, they may have moved here from California, Arizona, uh, Minnesota, uh, just transplants from other parts of the United States because it's a beautiful place to live. It's uh, cost effective and as far as buying property compared to other parts of the world world United States and so that has changed and Grove has grown and become more prosperous in certain ways not it's still a lot the same but Grove has, has grown and, and had more new people the southern part or J is kind of the central part uh, a lot of those people are still the same people families, no families, they've known their parents when someone, well, who's your mom or where, where's, who was your grandma or who, that very strong sense of community and connectedness is still there. Um, 
and I see that different in Grove. So that, not that it's not still here in Grove, but it's, it's a different type of thing. Jay is very uh, oriented to if someone has a health, health crisis, cancer or whatever, uh, they'll have a fundraiser, a pie auction. Uh, my dad frequently cooks for the fundraisers, Indian tacos, he does the fry bread to raise money just to help a family out. It's not, is it tax deductible or is it, you know, do they really need it or whatever. They see it, they see a need and people come together and donate things and donate their time and they buy the food. And, and so it, that part has not changed, um, but it, it, it has changed as far as that goes. And, and, and because there's not a lot of economic development, things are, are better in some ways it's not a whole lot different. They still need more opportunity, more economic opportunity and jobs. And um, there's still that. And, and of course not, I don't want to be negative about it, uh, but there's still that poverty and that sense of hopelessness and that uh, generational poverty and dependence on outside help and how can I, they, they don't see that they can get out of it. And that, that sense of poverty around the world is what keeps a lot of people in poverty. They just don't have the hope. And some, you know, there's material poverty, and then there's just the poverty of the, the, the life, life that they've dealt, been dealt in the family that they've seen. And occasionally, it seems like some parents didn't have what they thought they should have, broken homes and they sometimes don't seem like they want it for their children which I find hard I, I, I think they, they sometimes will try to hold on to their children so that they don't move away so that can be difficult so so uh, some changes I mean we have a brand new Sonic and Jay we had a Sonic before but Pizza Hut and, you know those kind of things but it's, it's a lot still the same as far as the, the people and the basics. And, and one of the reasons that we moved back is because um, we wanted our children to grow up in an area where God is still important, where the God of the Bible is still important, and the strong faith, and that's people use, use their faith to get through lots of struggles. And so I wanted that more for us as well. I wanted to get back to an area where that was important and I wanted my children raised in that and so um, that's still important in a lot of people's lives in, in, in Delaware County. Well you're also very active with mission trips. Yes. Can you touch upon that for me please? How much time do you have? <laughs> um, I, I, in I had a health crisis in 2001, 2001, 2002. And so I had to reevaluate my life and did I have my priorities where they needed to be? And um, so I decided probably not, that I did not. So I chose, chose. So we started becoming uh, more regular church attenders and I got involved with um, Closer Walk with God, and I got involved with Christian Veterinary Mission. Christian Veterinary Mission is an organization of veterinarians in the United States that has long-term missionaries in different parts of the world. Not a ton of them, uh, but uh, like in Kenya and Uganda and um, South America and Central America, and, and they even do some trips to some of the uh, reservations in the United States, uh, Native American reservations. And I went to a, a conference, I'm not sure what year it was, but 2008, maybe, 2007, in Kansas City. I just returned from that same conference, veterinary conference. And I heard an evening presentation from a veterinarian that um, was a small animal veterinarian who did mission work in Mongolia. And there was a clinic there, and they were training the young Mongolian veterinarians uh, veterinary medicine. Because before I knew it was a lot of, you know, go out and work on cattle in Africa and, 
and sheep and goats and camels and horses and I thought I'm, I'm not physically I've, I'm not so great at that and I don't have the knowledge base anymore because I haven't done it so I thought hey so I was walking away from there and I call my husband and I'm I can just see all the buildings and I'm walking along and I'm like hey Ron I just heard small animal veterinarians can do mission work in Mongolia I think that God's calling me to go to Mongolia and silence and then and he's like well that's okay. God wants you to go to Mongolia. That's fine, but I, so far he hasn't called me, so I'll, I'll, I'll just stay here while you go there. It was short term, for short term. So Ron's been very supportive. He hasn't gone on a trip with me yet. So I went to Mongolia and worked with small animal, young graduate Mongolian veterinarians. It's so much fun. And the culture difference and the food difference and the language difference and and it, it was it was great. So so I, I went there twice. One I spent a January of 2010. I was in Mongolia, minus 40. Minus 40 is the same in Celsius and Fahrenheit. They cross there. It's just cold. And when you walk outside, your eyelashes freeze, and that's the only part of you that you don't have covered. So that was quite an experience. And then I I thought, well, you know. This is great, but maybe I could do something else with CVM. They had a need to go to Kenya with a group, church planting group. Well, wasn't much small animal. So I went to Kenya and we worked on goats and sheep and unfortunately there was a Kenyan veterinarian there. God knows my limitations. And so I have not yet been on a trip. I've been on 10 mission trips. He's not yet put me, well, he's put me in some hard situations and some very challenging situations and some dangerous situations. But he's never put me out there as without another veterinarian who knew more about the animals we were working on, whether it be camels or donkeys or there's always been someone, usually a national veterinarian, a Kenyan veterinarian or a Ugandan veterinarian. And so I have worked with Ugandan vet students, uh, Kenyan vet students, Mongolian vet students, American vet students, and on these trips. And so it's, and sometimes there are no students, it's just other situations. So we've, yeah, done a lot of veterinary work in Africa now. And I still don't really know what I'm doing completely. But that's why they call it practice. We never get to where we know everything, here, there, or wherever. So it's just trust. It's it's just God's God's gonna send me there. He's gonna provide. He's gonna take care of me. And if he doesn't, I'm in good shape anyway. <laughs> so it's been a, it's been a great trip. But I didn't go on my first life's been a great trip. I didn't go on my first mission trip until 2008. So I've done 10 trips, and I didn't go last year or this year because I'm my kids decided to get married. No, just that wedding business is complicated. So. I, but I'm ready to go back. Making a difference. You know, I think so. And I think it's about, um, it's not mostly about the veterinary work. It's mostly about, well, sharing love of Jesus through veterinary medicine and relationships. And Americans are very task oriented. So it can be difficult for us when we go to other countries because we want to get the work done. And we're dealing with the nationals, and they've got their own speed, and their own techniques, and their own way of doing things. And because I didn't really know, well, I felt inadequate about a lot of that stuff that we were doing, and because I just like to talk to people, I could get in the African mode pretty easy. We could sit around and drink tea and, and get all that done before we started, you know, and if the vehicle breaks down, well, let's look around and see what is our opportunity here, and the vehicle will break down every time something different will happen. So I, I've been in a variety of situations, but I befriended some, I, and some of those um, young people that are in veterinary school also have internet when they're at their universities, and they have Facebook. So I'm Facebook friends with kids I call them kids because you know they're twenties from around the world. So I have Mongolian Facebook friends, I have Kenyan Facebook friends, Ugandan Facebook friends, and I've been to Rwanda as well. I've got a 
a Rwandan Facebook friend. And so we did a symposium at the veterinary school in Uganda. And there were other veterinarians there. It was a teaching, and then we went out and did a um, outreach with the students. This, and so uh, we do lectures on different things. And fortunately, I signed up late on that, so I'll, I only talked about cat restraint. And we did a demo about the cat jumping all over if they didn't know how to restrain it, and they thought that was funny. Humor usually translates, not always. But we, uh, so I got to be friends with these these young vet students from Uganda. And the next year I was going back, and I was going to go to Rwanda, and as the only American going on this trip, I've had a few of those, and. One of my friends who was going to get married sent me a message and said, if you're going to come to Rwanda, um, I'm getting married on September 7th or something. Could you come early and come to my wedding? It's in, uh, I think, Kabali in southern Uganda. She said it's close to Rwanda and you could come and I would love for you to come. And I thought, well, I might. So I did, and I hired a wildlife, young wildlife, uh, I think he's a wildlife biologist who was in, in kind of with the vet school, so I'd met him before, and he was starting to do business as being a guide, and so I was his first client. And he picked me up at the airport, and it was a long way to where that wedding was from Kampala. But we, we did a little safari, and he took me to uh, I forgot what it's called, Some one of the safari places and national parks. And I, uh, uh, yeah, I was his first client. He's a nice guy. We're still friends. He's going to marry. He's getting married in October, and he wanted me to come. He's marrying one of the veterinary students that I befriended. So that's really cool. So we went to the wedding, and I was the, at the, they have a, a ceremony that's usually a month before. It's called a giving away ceremony. There's a name for it, but I don't remember. Where the, actually the, the parents of the bride give the bride to the tribe of the husband-to-be, and then it's all very elaborate. So that was one day, so I got to be there. There were, there were 700 um, Ugandans there, and there were two girls from Sweden or something, and then me as far as the white people in the group. The next day was the church wedding, which had fewer attendees, but they have an MC at all of their things. It's a big deal. And so they introduced me, and that. And then at the church wedding, I hadn't met the pastor yet. And he said, yeah, and there's even this one white woman here from the U.S., <laughs> the white doctor from the U.S., and so it was the smallest attendant of the events. And then there was the reception in the, in the groom's territory, which was five hours away over the roads anyway. We ended up back in the, uh, they eat uh, a type of banana called matoki, which they use as a starch source. It's like, ma they mash it like mashed potatoes. So this reception was on the, the groom's family's area in their property. All fields of Matoki, and they had um, put tents up around. And his father was a physician. So, so it was a little, uh, I didn't know any of that when I said I was gonna come. And they had a big reception with native dancers, and there were a thousand Africans and one white person. And I was the white, token white person. It was great, I forgot I was white. Because those people, they're, they're not, I don't go there to do things for them, you know, as far as mission work goes. I go there with God's leading to walk alongside them, and if I can teach them skills, which usually I have some skills I can teach them, or some insight about life or about whatever, then I do that. I don't go there and do good stuff for them. They do good stuff for me. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, walking alongside, which is, is a, a mentality that we need to have if we're gonna help people without hurting. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's been a great, great experience the last several years, becoming a worldwide citizen. Not worldwide, I need, there's some other places I need to go, but, but to have real friends from another culture and to be able to share things with them and 
um, it's, it's, it's been awesome. And, you know, the veterinary aspect of that is what opens those doors. And without my, without my training at LSU, I wouldn't have that veterinary training. I wouldn't have the skills to be able to go share with those people. So that, that education has made a difference around the world. In it kind of leads into my next question about the impact of your education at OSU and, and how did it impact your life? Well, as a, I don't see myself as a veterinarian. Other people see me as a veterinarian as my primary title. I, I see myself as a, well, a child of God, but, you know, as a mother, as a wife, as a, and I also happen to be a veterinarian. And that's just some, some part. It does affect my whole life because it, it's, I mean, it's been what I wanted to do. And, and I work a fair amount and able to impact people locally as well. You know, in the small animal clinic, um, we help people learn how to care for their pets. We, we help them um, take proper care of their pets, we vaccinate them, we, you know, we spay and neuter, we do all of those kinds of things, but we also become friends with people there. And we walk through the life of that pet, we walk through the lives of their family frequently. Uh, we've had people long enough that their spouses have died or, you know, different deaths and issues in their family, and that's always very tied to their, pet, tied to their pets. And so their spouse may have passed away, and then this was this this is the only tie they have to that, so, which can be very stressful as a profession. And, and uh, unfortunately now, veterinarians have the highest suicide rate of white collar. We have uh, exceeded uh, dentists. Wow. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a problem that needs to be addressed. Why is that happening? And what can we do to help it? Um, it's compassion fatigue. It's dealing with a distraught patient, a distraught owner with a, a euthanasia in one room and then having to go into the next room with a new puppy. It's the huge amount of debt that the young graduates are, are graduating with and the financial, how can they pay that debt as a veterinarian? And so there's a lot of stress on veterinarians and, and, and that's, that's a really getting to be more and more of a pro and people don't expect that. They think they're a veterinarian, they get to play with animals. Well, you deal with people. Every, you hope every animal has a people. So we do a very high percentage of our work is with people. Communicating with people, um, listening to people, dealing with financial aspects, veterinary medicine, which is difficult. So the education, if I were not a veterinarian, and if I wish you had not educated me well, I wouldn't be able to do the job I do with the clients to, to help them through their issues and help the pets, obviously. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to use those skills to, to uh, you know, impact other cultures and to go, you know, around the world. Not around the world. I want to get around the world. And I can also use those skills. I, I train, I met um, a guy that, from John Brown. He's an engineering professor, and he and some other folks, I don't know the whole history, started an Institute for Biblical Community Development, and it's almost in Delaware County. It's, it's just south of the line, and it, they have a whole training center where JBU students come, missionaries come that are getting ready to go to other countries, foreign nationals, so for example, pastors from other countries come, and he does a training like how to build stoves, how to do community development, just different things like that, practical, not tying skills, how to fix basic mechanic stuff for these folks who will serve in other cultures in other parts of the world. And so the last few years, I have gone down during his training and shared about animal health. So I can even stay close to home and use the skills that I learned at OSU um, and even some of the animal science stuff to share with those folks who will then disseminate that information uh, into who knows where, in many areas. Well, I know you got to get running. Your clients probably want to see you at some point. But as we as we wind down, um, 
it seems many OSU alums are very loyal to the school. Uh, what do you think sparks such loyalty? I think OSU is a very down-to-earth school in that uh, the town is small compared to the size of the university. So a lot of folks from, particularly from rural Oklahoma, feel very at home in Stillwater and on the campus. And just the camaraderie um, with other OSU students, is, it seems different. It's hard to evaluate a different school in a different place, but I, I know some graduates, some recent graduates from other places, other professional, and I don't, I don't see, I don't see that. I don't see that they feel that way. And my, I, I wanted my daughter to go to OSU, and she, I don't know, she went somewhere else. And I said, oh, I love Stillwater. I just love Stillwater. I love OSU. And she's like, well, Mom, why don't you go back and get another degree? <laughs> so we would drive into Stillwater. I said, I love Stillwater. It's home. And so when I went there uh, last fall for the fall veterinary conference and had a, had a reunion of classmates, it's just home. It's just, it's just a, a feeling of home there and welcoming and it's just awesome. And orange is good too. You like orange? Orange is good. Orange is good. Um, what have we missed? Is there anything else you'd like to add before we close out today? I know we've taken a really quick tour of your life. I don't know. I'm sure we've missed something, and when I get finished later, I'm going to say, "What did I? Why didn't I say this, that, or whatever?" I, I think that the biggest thing that 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 we need to realize is that we're not here on this earth to become important. We're not here to be, oh, I have a, you know, I prestige or whatever. We're here on this earth to do what God has called each one of us to do. And for me, He called me to be a veterinarian. And that has, how that looks has changed over the years. Um, he's called me to help that client in the exam room who has a problem, and the problem may not even be an issue with the pet. The problem may be something going on in the family. And even though that's not part of our training, that is why they're there. They trust us. Veterinarians have a high level of community trust veterinarians. And we, we need to keep that we need to earn that and we need to, to keep that. But that sets us in a, in a spot where we need to, we have a responsibility. So we, we, um, we have that and as individuals, regardless of what it is, what are we really called to do? Are we, we're, am I called to spay cats? Well, yeah, sometimes I spay cats, but most of the time I'm helping those clients and their pet in whatever situation they're in, and whether that be here in the U.S., or whether that be in Mongolia, or whether that be in Uganda, or Kenya, or Rwanda, or wherever else he sends me, that those skills and those life skills that, that we learn throughout our life, we need to use in whatever way that we're directed to use, not just for our benefits, it's for other people. So the, Animals are great, but the people are equally as important, or more so. Oh, I think that's a good place to end. Okay. Uh, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for coming to Grove.